When we evaluate igneous rock texture, what we are looking at is the size, shape, and distribution of minerals and materials that can be found in the rock. And when we look at textures, we're going to see several different ones, starting with pegmatitic. Here we're looking at interlocking crystals that have a size greater than one centimeter. Now, to help this make sense, we look at a rock and we can see different minerals making it up, light colors, dark colors. And when we look in the rock, we can see that there are very large crystals. We can see the light shining off of them in this rock. And to give it a perspective that makes sense, if we look at the one centimeter size that needs to be met in order to be pegmatitic, we're looking at something about the size of the average adult pinky fingernail. So the thing all the way from the cuticle to the tip, not just the part that's white at the end. So if you take your fingernail and you compare it to the crystals in the rock, we can see obviously much, much larger than one centimeter in size for the muscovite. And also if we look at the dark colored mineral, which in this case is tourmaline, and we compare our pinky fingernail, we're seeing about the same size, maybe slightly larger for the mineral crystal. So we know that because the crystals are so large, that rock would have a pegmatitic texture. The second texture that we look at is phaneritic. And here we're looking at interlocking crystals between one millimeter and one centimeter in size. So this means all of the crystals that make up the rock are large enough to see with the naked eye versus the pegmatitic texture that was very, very large crystals. So when we look at phaneritic rocks, or rocks that have a phaneritic texture, we're going to look for two things. We're going to look for what here is in quotations called glittering, uh, glitter or light shining off the surface of the mineral. And the second thing we will look for is an even distribution of colors looking at the crystals of the rock. So for the first part, glittering, when we look at this rock, we might see it's dark in color. It's not as easy to see that there are multiple minerals making up the rock. However, when we move the rock, we can see light and little bursts of light coming off the surface of the rock. Now, that means that the crystals have grown large enough, we are either seeing cleavage planes for individual crystals or faces of crystals uh, because they are large enough for us to see and get that kind of flash bulb pop of light off the surface. Even if the rock is made up of minerals with drastically different colors, we still can get that burst of light glittering appearance, again telling us all the crystals are big. We're looking at a phaneritic texture in this igneous rock. If we have a rock like this one, you can see it's not shining as much. The bursts of light are not really popping off of this rock. Here's where we're looking for that even distribution of color to tell us phaneritic. If we compare it to another rock that is not phaneritic texture, the rock that we're looking at now, you can see kind of has blobs of white or white crystals in sort of this black background color versus an even distribution more like a Dalmatian uh, with spots, even distribution of white and black throughout the rock. So again, for phaneritic texture, look for bursts of light and glittering off the surface or an even distribution of color. The cooling history for both pegmatitic and phaneritic is intrusive. This means that from the melt, the crystals formed while the magma was still below the surface of the earth. And because it takes longer for magma to cool below the surface of the earth, there is more time for the crystals to grow, which is why they are larger in size. The next <coughs> excuse me, texture that we're going to look at is called porphyritic. And in a porphyritic rock, we have a mix of large and small interlocking crystals. So what we're going to look for is, again in quotations, the first thing, a cookie with chips, like a chocolate chip cookie, the large crystals being the chips, which we call phenocrysts, the small crystals being the ground mass, or what is surrounding them. And the second thing we're going to look for is shine of the phenocrysts on top of 
the base color, which are the small crystals in the background. So for that to make sense, let's look at this rock. In this rock, you can see there are dark colored phenocrysts, which are again the chips, that are sitting in this gray colored ground mass or background. And when I wiggle it, you can see that off of the black mineral surfaces, you're getting that burst of light. That's telling you those crystals are large, which we call phenocrysts. The gray color in the background has small crystals, so here we're seeing the mix of large and small. In other rocks, it won't be as easy to see as that example. For this one, you can see kind of this speckled uh, series of dark minerals in this rock. They do shine just a little bit, and because we're looking at a mix of big and small, although they're not nearly as big as the last rock, the dark colored minerals, the ground mass is the tannish light color in the background. This would still qualify as porphyritic. And the final rock, porphyritic texture, does not shine at all. Uh, the minerals in this one are not nearly as reflective. We here are looking still at porphyritic texture. You can see the shape of the white crystals, nice, clear, clean shapes. This time the white crystals are the chips or phenocrysts, and the small crystals are the black background ground mass. When looking at porphyritic texture for these rocks, the cooling history is mixed, intrusive and extrusive. What that means is that the phenocrysts formed and grew while the melt was still below the surface of the earth at depth, which would be intrusive. The melt then erupted out of the volcano and the ground mass, or small crystals, formed and grew after the melt was at the surface. So the phenocryst would have grown in what's called the magma when the melt is below the surface, and the ground mass crystals that are small grew from lava after the volcano had erupted, in most cases, as a generalization. The next texture that we will look at is affinitic. In affinitic rocks, we are looking at interlocking crystals of one millimeter in size and smaller. So for one millimeter, consider the tip of your fingernail, which mine are cut very short, but where the white of the nail is, that's about one millimeter in size. What do we look for in affinitic rocks? We look for a base color that may have a few crystals large enough to see. So when we pick out a couple of affinitic rocks, we see that instead of seeing crystals that are large or getting any kinds of bursts in light, here we're looking at really one general color to make up our rock. We can wiggle it around, the light is just kind of going across the surface or waxing across it rather than actually popping off it. Now you will have cases every now and then, you can see a little one uh, by my finger here, where there may be a few crystals large enough to see or get bursts of light off of, but as a whole, the rock is one color, what we call the base color. Same thing if the rock is light in color. Again, we're seeing it's dominated by this pinkish sort of color all around, and maybe here and there we're getting a few bursts of light, like that one there, coming off of the surface. <clears throat> the next texture that we have to look at is called vesicular. And when we look at a vesicular rock, we're seeing uh, the result of lava that had gas being released as bubbles that then locked in the remnant of the bubble as the rock cooled <clears throat> from the lava. In vesicular rocks, we are looking for what we like to refer to as the Swiss cheese appearance, a bunch of holes. And when we hold it in our hand, it's very lightweight because all of that gas left open spaces or pockets of open space that make it very light. And when we look at vesicular texture, you can see right away these were gas bubbles in the past, that Swiss cheese appearance, and also very light for its size. Same thing for the light-colored igneous rock that is vesicular texture. Again, you can see the holes telling you gas bubbles and extremely lightweight in your hand. The next igneous rock texture is glassy, and glassy texture forms when melt cools so rapidly it remains a liquid 
and hardens into glass. So when you ask a geologist, glass is a liquid because the atomic arrangement at the crystal structure level is so chaotic it hasn't become a solid because solids have highly ordered atomic arrangements. So when we're holding this, it is volcanic glass and it feels nice and firm, but because the atoms are not arranged on the inside in an orderly fashion, we actually still look at this as a liquid. So when you hold a rock with glassy texture, an igneous rock with glassy texture, you can see that it looks like glass. It's typically dark black in color. There are reddish brown and even in some cases clear varieties or green varieties. Most of the ones you will see with us are dark black in color. You can see it shines like glass, it feels like glass, and it has a special characteristic uh, called conchoidal fracture, which if we look closely, you can see kind of like a uh, shell that you would find at the ocean. It has all these concentric sort of circles where it's been struck or hit something in the past. So for glassy rocks, look for typically dark colored glass. Black is the variety we have the most of and look for that conchoidal fracture. The last texture that we have to look at is called pyroclastic. We break that word apart, pyro meaning fire, clastic meaning broken pieces. So what we're looking at in a pyroclastic textured igneous rock is ash and fragments of rocks that were erupted out of the volcano and have been welded together to make a solid rock. Now that welding normally happens after the ash and rock fragments settle and lava comes in over the top. The heat of the lava welds the ash and rock fragments below into a solid rock. When we hold a pyroclastic rock or looking at rocks with pyroclastic texture, they should be very rough feeling on our fingers and they may leave a very fine powder on our fingers when we rub it across the rock. That's actually the ash that we're liberating from the rock then getting stuck to our finger. And it's very faint, but hopefully you can see that in the screen. So you can see little bits of rock fragments. Kind of reminds you of porphyritic texture where we have some big and then some small. But when we have porphyritic texture, the rock should feel relatively smooth. And we should get some shine off of the larger pieces in a porphyritic rock. With pyroclastic, which is what this rock is, we're not getting any shine. The feeling of the rock on the fingers is much rougher. And then again, that fine powder is actually the ash that we're pulling out of the rock as we handle it. When we look at our extrusive igneous rock textures, which are affinitic, for these two rocks, vesicular for these two, pyroclastic and glassy, we are looking at textures that have cooled from lava, which makes them extrusive, and it is often the ejection of materials from the surface of the volcano. There are rare instances where the melt will go to a very shallow depth, it won't come out of the volcano, and you can still get these extrusive textures. But for our purposes, when you think extrusive texture, think material has come out of the volcano. Lava has come out, and crystals form at the surface of the, on top of the volcano to make affinitic texture. Lava comes out and hits cold ocean water, or it's ejected high into the atmosphere in a violent eruption and you get glassy texture. If your lava has lots of gas bubbles, you can get vesicular texture. Or when we're looking at a pyroclastic texture, think of something like the ash cloud coming raining down uh, as a flow on the side of the volcano. These are the igneous rock textures that you will need to be familiar with for our class.